As you were just saying, uh, my name is Matt Lucas. Uh, so I work for IBM in what we call um, Global Blockchain Engagement. So what I do is I um, talk to clients about what blockchain is, what it can do, the use cases, the technical <coughs> deep dives, all that kind of thing, and the technologies and so on. Um, and the purpose today is to really talk about some of those use cases, about what the broad, what it means in a broader sense, what blockchain is all about, um, as opposed to purely looking at things like cryptocurrencies. Um, I'll be here afterwards as well if you do have any, any further questions. Uh, feel free to um, feel free to, to ask as we go forward. That is totally fine. Now the way we t start talking about blockchain with our clients is not to go headlong straight into the technology. There's a lot of stuff you can find on the web around the, the, the um, how blockchain works from a technical point of view. Um, a lot of the discussions that we have relate to how business works and how blockchain applies to that, the so what question. So what we start doing when having a, any kind of blockchain discussion is by thinking about the concept of business networks and how wealth is generated in any economy. Um, well, as, as we all know, that no business operates in isolation. The way we generate wealth is by flowing goods and services over business networks. Business networks can be either in a particular region, they can span multiple industries, you can have supply chains or you know, banks talking to other banks, or whatever it happens to be, but you need a business network. A business needs a network in order to survive. So that's the first major concept that we, we discuss when, when talking about blockchain with clients. The second major concept is the concept of assets. Um, anything that has value. Now, those of you who've got background in either um, economics or um, uh, business studies, we know about intangible and tangible assets. So you've got tangible assets, things that you can touch, hold and feel, things like cars. You have intangible assets, the right to listen to a particular piece of music, or there's uh, artwork, or, or uh, bonds or securities, or um, intellectual property. All these are examples of assets as well. Cash is also an asset. Um, it is somewhat unique, um, although you can think of other examples in the fact that it's anonymous. It's one of the few asset types that has no identity associated with it. The fact that I may have £10 in my wallet, that's what makes the £10 mine, it's the fact it's in my wallet, there's nothing that says it's mine. Okay. That represents a problem. Um, most notably, governments, it well, comes no surprise if you to learn that governments hate cash. Um, because it's difficult to track, difficult to trace, difficult to tax. Um, and so, cash is interesting when it comes to looking at, at ledgering technologies and when looking at things like Bitcoin. We'll cover more about that later on. So various types of assets. So we talk about business networks, we talk about um, assets. Third thing is the concept of the ledger. Now the ledger is the most important system of record in any organisation. Ledgers have been around since actually 1494. There's a Franciscan monk called Luca Pacioli created the concept of double entry bookkeeping. It hasn't changed fundamentally since that time. It's, uh, it's still there. Obviously, we don't use leather bound books to record um, uh, ledgers today. We use electronic systems of record, but the concept stays the same. And that concept is it's a transaction log, it's a log of the inputs and outputs of a business. And it's important because it describes the liquidity position of a business, what it's worth. So let's say, um, you know, let's say I was buying your car from you. Uh, I would record that in my ledger as the receipt of one car in exchange for some money, and yours will have a copy of that same transaction, but obviously in reverse. And so we'd both record that. We'd each have our own system of record. Think about a contract as well. Now contracts, if you think about it, they are really just the prerequisites for a transaction to be valid. So if the car were to break down in six months, that's, let's say you are a third party arbitrator, you say that's, that's it, it broke down and I'm entitled to my money back. So you have business networks, assets, you have ledgers and you have contracts. Now with these two things particularly, there are problems. Now the most significant problem with the ledger is the fact that we each have our own copy. And, and one of the biggest costs that organisations face is the cost of reconciliation. Ensuring that what you've got recorded on your ledger matches what I've got recorded on mine. 
end of day processing. Sometimes it can be, up to, depending on the assets type for, an, for a bank, it could be up to a year before a particular transaction can be cleared, agreed by both parties. It can be a very manual process. So that's one problem, is the, the cost of reconciliation. Um, we all know the problems with contracts. The contracts are very ambiguous by their nature. Uh, it can take teams of lawyers, it can take judges a long time to discover the meaning, the intended meaning behind a contract, and it can be very costly. Blockchain aims to solve those two problems in particular. Now, your definition of what a blockchain is can vary. There are a number of definitions out there, and that's all totally fine. There's a, there is a, a view that is quite a purist in its approach that talks about the Bitcoin blockchain. There's a more general view um, that has sort of entered more mainstream uh, view uh, um, parlance now. And that's the, the following. If you think about it, this is it. And if you, want, if you want to bluff your way in blockchain, these are the three words that you need. Shared, replicated, ledger. That's it. So, firstly, it's a ledger. It's a, it's a description of the outputs of a business, describes the liquidity position, it's a transaction log, all of those things that, that we think of when thinking of a ledger. However, it's shared, which means that the participants of the business network see the same ledger. So you avoid the cost of reconciliation. As good computer scientists will tell us, as, as we know, we want to avoid single points of failure. So we're going to replicate it as well. So you have your copy, I have my copy, and they're kept in sync in some way, perhaps in replication. As I said before, there, there, are, there are public uh, blockchains that anybody can join, sort of more business to consumer or even consumer-to-consumer -consumer use cases. But there are also private permission networks as well. <coughs> and for those uh, private networks, I would put the word permissioned in there as well, because you need to know who you're dealing with. Every single business, certainly with whom uh, IBM works, is regulated in some way, and the regulations include things like anti-money laundering, KYC, know your customer, combating the financing of terrorism. These are all things that require businesses to know exactly who they are dealing with. But more on that in a little while. Every single blockchain in existence, though, aims to solve this problem of trust. So that when you add a transaction to a blockchain, it's irrefutable that that transaction occurred. What does that mean? Blockchain actually has four qualities of service. And these are the four ones that you can see here. The first one is consensus. And that means that the relevant counterparties associated with the transaction will have agreed Consensus just means agreement, will have agreed that the transaction occurred. Now, if we're just using public private key cryptography, that kind of thing, it could be that I've applied my digital signature to a, a particular transaction and you've applied yours. And assuming that we both can see the same facts and we agree that we see the same facts, it's now irrefutable, so there's no dispute. So that's the first thing, consensus. The second one is provenance. Provenance means history. If I own uh, a car today, you owned it the day before, maybe you owned it the day before that, me as the current owner of the car, I should be able to see that entire history associated with it and know where that asset came from. So I certainly would if I was a regulator as well. And that's what we mean by provenance. The third one is immutability. A blockchain is an append-only data structure. You can't go and insert transactions into the middle of a blockchain. You can't go and modify transactions once they've been committed. You can't go and delete transactions, which is why it's great for auditing, for transparency. Okay. And the data structure that we use, uh, it's a, a variant of a hash chain that includes some Merkle trees in there. That gives us immutability over a distributed network. And the last quality of service is finality. And that means it's an agreed source of truth. Because there's no point in saying, look, let's say we, we've got a, a shared ledger that we have between us, and, but actually my real source of truth is stored in some other database back here inside my data center. Because if that was the case, we haven't solved that problem of reconciliation because that data, database could get out of sync with our shared ledger. So it needs to be an agreed source of truth. Well, okay so far, yeah? Good. Right. It's worthwhile at this point talking about Bitcoin, because that's really where a lot of people get their first experience of blockchain technology. 
Um, there is a lot of confusion related to Bitcoin versus blockchain. Um, I'll give an example. Back in um, late 2015, early 2016, Sir Mark Walpert, the UK's chief scientific advisor, released an 88-page document on the use of blockchain in the UK government. Uh, the, the potential use cases. So it was a really good read. You go and download it from gov.uk. It talks about um, uh, land registries. It talks about electronic medical records and loads of things. Go and download it if you want. What I found interesting, though, was the way it was reported the day after it was released. It was reported in the Sunday Times, you can look for it, um, and the headline was UK Government to use Bitcoin technology for welfare payments. <laughs> Which is technically completely accurate, but totally misses the point. Um, because blockchain is Bitcoin technology, it, it is the technology that underpins Bitcoin, it is the ledger that Bitcoin has. And welfare was one of the use cases that the, the government was looking at, but not in terms of the cryptocurrency. It was using it as a ledger. So there is confusion there. So Bitcoin is really the first mainstream blockchain application. Um, it's two things, though. Um, it is the ledger, but it is also the asset that gets stored on it as well. And people are using Bitcoin as a commodity in buying and selling in, in Bitcoin. Um, and as, as we know, it, it, depending on the variant of Bitcoin, it can be very, very expensive. Now, when we talk about blockchain for business, we actually mean anything, using the, the blockchain to store anything of value, any tangible or intangible asset. Maybe it's the digital representation of currency, maybe it's a car, or maybe it's a house, or maybe it's intellectual property. Any of these assets could be stored on a blockchain. You don't need cryptocurrency in order to do that. The second big difference is how that network is, is, is formed. Now, Bitcoin is what we call pseudonymous. There's no identity associated with Bitcoin transactions. So you can now go onto a website, you can go onto a website called blockchain.info, and you can see the entire Bitcoin ledger. Every single transaction that's ever occurred. However, if you were to look at the details of the transaction, the sender and the receiver is a meaningless sequence of numbers. They call it pseudonymous because you could look for patterns of behaviour. If you started transferring large amounts of money around, you can get a kind of general feel. But it is fundamentally anonymous. There's no identity on the network. And that has a, a, a few implications. Um, because, uh, because it's uh, anonymous, there's no identity, it means that businesses find it very difficult to adopt Bitcoin, established businesses. Businesses that have got um, anti-money laundering requirements, know your customer requirements, can't adopt anonymous technology. I, um, a couple of years ago, went to buy a car. I was talking with the car dealer. If you go into a car dealer's and you talk, talk, take more than 9,000 euros in cash, you know, say a big suitcase full of cash, uh, you couldn't drive away with the car there and then. You'd have to wait 24 hours, you'd have to have a, uh, an interview with someone from Customs and Excise who would ask you where you got the money. Because, again, that's one of the problems of, of having something that's, uh, that's anonymous. So, yeah, blockchain for business requires identity on the network. You need to know who you're dealing with. Think about it. Anonymity means that you know something happened, but not who did it. Privacy is the total opposite. It means that you know who you're dealing with, but not necessarily the transaction that occurred. Totally opposite. Yeah. Um, and the other, the other thing about um, anonymity on the network is that you don't know the person that you're dealing with is trying to defraud the network. So Bitcoin does something that's really, really cool. It does that's something called proof of work. What proof of work is, it's a means of adding an artificial cost to the system to disincentivize fraudulent behavior. And that cost is electricity. If you want to validate transactions on the Bitcoin network, you have to prove to the network you've burnt electricity. You've incurred the cost of burning electricity. And they do that by forcing you to solve difficult cryptographic puzzles. It's like me saying, um, you can ask, ask me a question. If you want to ask a question, then in order to do so, you must uh, first solve the Rubik's Cube that I've put in front of you. Show me you're working to the Rubik's Cube. I know you're serious about asking a question. That's what proof of work is. Um, blockchain for business has none of that. 
doesn't need cryptographic mining, it doesn't need proof of work, because you already know who you're dealing with. And you know, if I'm doing business with you, we already both stand to lose either reputationally or financially if you start putting in bad transactions. You're not going to be in business very long if you start putting in bad transactions. So we can get away with much lighter weight forms of consensus and validation. So those are the big differences that we see. And also, you know, when it comes to that validation, we can make it further more efficient. So what Bitcoin does is it does throw transactions to the entire network to validate. And that's not really how business works. How business works today, let's say I wanted to transfer funds to you, or send £100 uh, pounds to you. Who would, who would need to sign off on that transaction? Well, your bank would, my bank would, maybe your uh, third party payments provider, your Visa or MasterCard. The three of us need to sign off on that transaction. And if the three of us says it's okay, it's okay. What we wouldn't do is throw it to the network. That's, that's what Bitcoin does. Uh, because not only is that inefficient, having the whole network see that, it also would probably breach confidentiality as well. Um, blockchain for business need two things. They need privacy and they need confidentiality. They need privacy, i.e. we need to be able to control who can join our network. But individual transactions also need to be confidential. Because if I'm giving you a 10% discount and you have a 20% discount, I don't want you to know that he's getting a better discount than you. Or, to put it another way, if I send £500 to you and I were to be able to look on the ledger and see that whenever I send you £500, there's a mysterious transaction of £500 from you to someone else, I'm quickly going to figure out you're a middleman. In the future, I'll go directly to, the, to someone else. Okay? So there's a number of reasons why, why you need that confidentiality. And for all of that, you need identity on the network. Who you're dealing with. The potential for this is huge. Think about HTTP. HTTP completely revolutionised information flow. It allows information to flow from any one person to any other person without friction. China and North Korea to one side. Imagine if we could do the same for assets. If we could do the same for transactions. Imagine being able to do a transaction with someone without friction whatsoever, without incurring middlemen or, or anything like that. That would be big, wouldn't it? I'll give you some examples of some of the um, bigger use cases that we see around blockchain. This is about um, trade. Um, a third of us, uh, according to a 2009 report by the UN, um, a third of Afghanistan's GDP is spent on bribery and corruption. It's, it's absolutely insane. Now, uh, one of the things that you can do with uh, blockchain is you have this concept of smart contracts, just like normal contracts, now you to specify the business rules associated with the transaction. Now imagine being able for an individual or a government or a company being able to give money to a, a country and stipulate the rules of that transaction, i.e. how it's going to be spent. So it's, you can stipulate spent in a certain, in a certain way with a certain provider, medicines, not guns. Yeah? That would be huge. Um, pick another one. Anyone who lives on a floodplain, talk to anyone who's lived on a floodplain, know how difficult it is to get insurance. In California, 12% of homes have earthquake insurance. California, as I'm sure you know, <laughs> lives on the San Andreas Fault. 12%. In Florida, the state has had to step in as insurer of last resort because no one insurer can adequately cover the risk associated with the Florida storms. And the world is seeing an increase in extreme weather events. This problem is going to get worse. How do we solve that problem? Well, there is something called catastrophe bonds. What catastrophe bonds are is a means for insurers to spread the risk. So instead of one insurer covering that risk, and no one will do it if you live on a floodplain, if you can spread that risk onto multiple insurers, that's good because you're spreading the risk over a wider area. It means that people who couldn't otherwise get cover can get cover. The problem with that is you've got a very complex business network with multiple insurers. In the event of your house being raised to the ground through whatever natural disaster, it can take weeks, if not months, for the insurers to agree where that money actually comes from. 
because it's a very manual process. Trying to get any business to talk to any other business is a manual process. It, that's a generalisation. Um, but there, are, there are, are, are various business processes that are extremely manual and very resist, resistant to change. If you could automate that process, automate that business network, and blockchain can be used to do that, you can automate that entire claim um, and settle, get the money to where it's needed in a matter of hours rather than weeks and months. That's good. The third one. Um, this is a picture that was taken from, those of you old enough to remember, a picture that's taken from the year 2000 presidential election between Bush and Gore, which you may remember was settled by a judge. There was the problem in Florida around hanging chads and how votes were, were the intention behind votes. This is the point behind dispute resolution. Anything involving disputes. Because with a blockchain, you can irrefutably record a transaction. Now, a few things on this. Um, let's say I was let's say I was buying your house. Right? I was buying your house today. What would happen is I would go to a solicitor, a conveyancer, and I would give uh, money. You would go to the same or a different solicitor and give the deeds to the house. On an agreed date and time, the solicitor would swap the deeds and money. So I'd get the deeds, you'd get the money. What is the solicitor network, the conveyancing network, fundamentally doing in that scenario? Why do we have them? Trust. That's the reason why we have them. They're a trusted third party. They are trusted to hold both the deeds and the money at the same time and not run off with them. And this is the same for every significant financial transaction that we do. The notion of trusted third parties. Now, if we had a data structure that we could share that could irrefutably record who owns the house at a given date and time, we no longer need a trusted third party to manage that transaction for us. That would be big. That would be huge. Now, it's, no, it's no surprise for you to learn that um, one of the early adopters of blockchain technology is at central banks. Now, if, if you've got a business network that spans from a central bank through to consumers, what's the purpose of a bank? Why do we have banks? Banks are there to provide trust. I trust my bank to hold my money rather than me keeping it under the mattress. Yeah? It's raising fundamental questions around the nature of business. Quite a big, quite a big area. So yeah, um, uh, dispute uh, resolution is a, is, is a, a very big one. Now, um, in relation to that, I would put a small note of caution. Um, I think about, you know, sometimes people talk about the, the possibility of blockchain for doing things like voting, doing national election voting, um, particularly in, in third world countries where the vote may not be perceived as, um, as entirely accurate. So technology-wise, we know how to do that on a blockchain. You could cast your vote on a blockchain uh, once and once only. There would be a verifiable technological trail behind that that would guarantee that the correct votes are cast and counted accordingly. However, proof is not the same as trust. Blockchain gives you irrefutable proof that something happened. It's up to the electorate to decide whether or not to trust that. And if there's one thing I've learned over the last two years with Brexit and Trump, is that proof and trust are not the same thing. Yeah? So, there is a debate that we would need to have. I think for, in order for any, for any voting system around blockchain or any other technology, you need a verifiable paper audit trail. Because otherwise, I think at the moment, electorate wouldn't, wouldn't trust it. People don't trust uh, technology full stop. Um, the same goes for things like electronic med medical records. You, using a blockchain, you can create an electronic medical record that you are in control of as the, the owner of that medical data. And you can choose to give your identity, uh, um, as in your um, medical data, uh, say that much to your uh, to the government, that much to your uh, in, uh, private health insurer, maybe that much to your GP, that much to your physiotherapist, or whatever. You can choose that. There are various blockchain-based technologies that will give you that capability. But would you trust it? Would would, you know, would your 90-year-old granny trust it? 
And that's a, that's a society debate that we haven't had yet. Okay, so it's more than just the technology. Anyway, um, I digress somewhat. Let's talk about some more, um, uh, some other use cases that uh, we have implemented recently. These are all ones that we've done in IBM, we've done quite a few uh, in, in blockchain, this is just a bit of them. Um, IBM in January did a, a joint venture with Maersk, who is the um, global shipping provider, um, to digitise global trade. Um, there's a huge amount of inefficiency in global trade at the moment. Um, so sometimes the cost of the paperwork associated with uh, moving a good from one place to another is more than the cost of the good itself. Because it's, it's very much a paper-based trail today. And the reason is that no one's wanted to digitise it in the past because the business network is so big. And that also applies for things like letters of credit, um, which hasn't changed in four or five hundred years. So if we could digitise that and provide a verifiable trail over supply chain, that would be, be big. A uh, second example is what Walmart, uh, the retailer, who are using something called the um, Food Trust Network, um, a, a blockchain-based solution that will track the provenance of food through a supply chain. Um, do you remember the horse meat scandal a few years ago? Right? You go to Tesco and there was lasagna that was labelled as beef and it turned out there was horse meat inside it. And Tesco turned their hand up and said, well, we don't know where it came from. There's no transparency, no end-to-end -end visibility of the supply chain today. And supply chains are extremely complex. You go multiple job fees, multiple suppliers, and it can be really, really difficult. And, and so what Food Trust is all about is providing provenance from the farms, the, uh, the abattoirs, all the different places that, that produce a good all the way through to the consumer and make that verifiable. Um, there is, a, again, another note of caution that I'll give you there. Uh, firstly, uh, well, and, and that note is that what blockchain can't do is it can't stop the abattoir from choosing to kill a horse and chuck it in, in the big pot labelled cow and signing off as a cow-based transaction and sending it on down the supply chain. It can absolutely do that. However, what blockchain could give you is retribution. In the, in the event of a problem, you can now trace it back to that farm and there won't be in business very long. You now know exactly where it came from. Uh, the last thing is about um, is a, a company called WeTrade. It, it's a consortium of uh, nine, actually slightly more, uh, banks now. So banks like um, uh, HSBC, uh, Nordea, um, various other ones as well, um, that are aiming to um, ha implement uh, trade finance for small and medium businesses. At the moment, the cost of doing trade finance for organisations uh, for smaller organisations just isn't worth big banks uh, while it costs too much because it's a very manual process. And so what we trade aims to do is to use blockchain to automate that process of doing trade finance and thus opening it up to uh, small and medium businesses. It's another really good um, area. The final thing I wanted to talk about then um, it's about the state of the technology, where we currently are, and as I've alluded to already, it is extremely early days when it comes to uh, a blockchain, uh, regardless of the platform that you look at. Um, you look at the analysis, uh, the um, uh, analyst reports, end-to-end -end mainstream adoption is five to ten years away. Now we have use cases in production already, we've got people sending real transactions through blockchains today. Um, businesses as, as, as well as consumers, of course. But it is still quite early days, and the technology is still maturing. Now, what's driven a lot of the growth in blockchain, and a lot of the hype, and, and we are, look at Gartner and Forrester, we are at the top of the hype curve when it comes to blockchain, ready to slide down into that trough of disillusionment, is um, a lot of it's driven through the use of cryptocurrencies like, uh, like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. Um, you can go on to coinmarketcap.com and you can see there are roughly 1,600 cryptocurrencies listed there um, with a you know, frankly insane market capitalization on, on, on some of them. And um, there are more digital currencies, more cryptocurrencies than there are real currencies in the world, um, which is quite uh, astonishing when you think about it. 
Um, a large portion of them are, are forks of either Bitcoin or Ethereum. Now, I've talked about Bitcoin a lot already. Uh, another one that you may hear about quite a lot is one called Ethereum. Um, that does have a cryptocurrency built in called Ether, um, but it is not built around the cryptocurrency. It's actually a platform for running what they call smart contracts, um, for running code in a distributed way. For those of you who've got a database background, it's a bit like running a distributed stored procedure call on a database. Um, however, uh, the problem that we currently see with Ethereum and Ethereum-based currencies um, <coughs> is that people are using it as a commodity, people are investing in it, and often without understanding what it is, and by treating it as a commodity, the price has gone up quite significantly. And you need, on a public network, you need something intrinsic of value to incentivize participation. I'm not going to burn the CPU on my laptop if I'm not going to get paid for doing it. To go, I'm not going to confirm other people's transactions unless you give me a share of the transaction fees. Yeah? And as a result, given that people are treating it as a commodity, it's now, there's a, a, a very good article I read on a website called Hacker Noon about three months ago. The price of Ether has gone up so much, it's actually 400 million times more expensive to do computation on Ethereum than it is to run it on commodity AWS, hardware, Amazon Web Services, commodity cloud. And that's insane because um, the Ether is there as a means of making the system work, for incentivizing participation and for stopping smart contracts, as this notion of gas that, that, that prevents smart contracts from going out of control. Um, so it is actually a fundamental problem that we have there. Um, and also, when you have something intrinsic of value on a blockchain, it does mean that's going to be a target for um, hackers, as we've seen of, of hack, recent hacks on things like Ethereum and, and on Bitcoin as well. Now, that's not to say there aren't um, good business to consumer use cases. Um, what we also see, though, is a lot of activity in the business to business space as well. And that really is, is being driven in a large part by one of the most advanced ones. It's through um, a set of technologies through the Linux Foundation. That's called Hyperledger. Now that was started in February 2016. Uh, that was when the initial announce was. Uh, the executive director is someone called Brian Bellendorf, who was the founder of Apache. Now the big difference with Hyperledger is there's no cryptocurrency. Um, now you could choose to implement one on there, but there's nothing intrinsic of value there. And it's meant for business to business transactions where you have identity on the network. You know who you're dealing with. So it's about private, permissioned networks. Um, so it does have a, a different, uh, there's no real overlap in, in use cases. This, this is more about public networks. This is more today about private networks, private permissioned networks. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Um, just in the same way that you've got uh, pub the public internet today and you have private B2B networks. And there's a, there's a, uh, a fair amount of um, maturity that's going on on all of these, uh, on all of these platforms.